Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. Verses 27 to 31. Matthew 24, 27 to 31. Let me read this portion to you. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For, whereso, whose, sorry, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. May the Lord help us in the study of this portion of the scriptures. The sign of the Son of Man, as Jesus spoke in verse 30, shall be in heaven. And this is a matter of great interest to us. The days prior to Jesus' return to this earth will be full of confusion. As we saw in the earlier passage, Jesus said, There shall arise false Christ and false prophets, that's in verse 24, and shall show great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. So, the Lord Jesus said that there will be great confusion. We already ha have such confusion in many places. This morning during the GBI class on the book of Revelation, I told them a story of a town in South Africa um, where there's a pastor who comes to his congregation in a very expensive car and he is always attended to by special people who act like security guards and when he opens the door his driver opens his, uh, opens the door for the pastor and he kneels immediately at the on the ground and all the people will kneel along the road to the church and screaming and shouting and we have such situation already i mentioned one last week in the philippines in the city of davao who calls himself the son of God, who says that Dawah is the new Jerusalem. So if you go to Dawah, you end the new Jerusalem. And such people appear, and it's going to get worse in the tribulation period. From verses 4 up to this passage that we are studying today, which is starting with verse 27, we have signs of tribulation. Many things that will happen during the tribulation time. And it is parallel to what we have been learning in the book of Revelation. From chapter 6 onwards, we saw the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the wild judgments, which bring about all of these signs that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24. And so... There will be great confusion in the mind of the people prior to Jesus' return. 
But we are told right here in verse 27, for Jesus will come as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west. So his coming will not be secret. It will not be in a corner of a wilderness or in a closet in a palace or in a house. Jesus will not appear here and there. He will not be coming like the way he came first time as to be our savior, to give his life as a ransom. Second time when he comes to this world to rule again, we call it the return of Christ, it will be an obvious, a manifested appearance of Christ. And it will be in glory. And so don't let anybody mislead. And there will be one great wonders and signs that he mentioned. And uh, uh, which are calamitous in nature. Which will happen. And in fact, uh, I will mention some of them as we go forward. It is made necessary by the text. Uh, however, for now, take note. It, it is to be understood carefully that Jesus will come just like the lightning comes from the east and flashes across the canopy to the west. And what Jesus is assuring us is that it will be a sudden coming and his coming will be so sudden and yet so powerfully manifest. Jesus said I, uh, uh, during uh, his time on earth, uh, that he will go and prepare a place for us. And that he will come again. And God's people are always waiting for it. At his ascension to heaven. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. We have very clear record of this as well. That Jesus will return just as he went up. The angels in white apparel said. Ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Jesus was taken up in cloud, and he shall come back in clouds. And you will see his coming just like a flash across the earth. In, in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 7, we read this. Let me read Again, this passage to you. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Watch that. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. That's Revelation 1.7. So Jesus' coming will not be some sort of uh, quiet affair which happens in a corner it's a universal coming now what i'm talking to you is not the rapture rapture happens way before this seven years before this at least seven years before this we don't know what exact time jesus will come to call the church and the church that is on earth whether they are dead or alive will all be changed in a moment, as in 1 Corinthians 15, we are told, and we'll be taken up. Then the seven years of tribulation and all the signs that Jesus thus far spoke in the earlier passage of Matthew 24, verses 4 to 26, will happen. Including the desolation, the, abom the abomination of desolation predicted by uh, Daniel the prophet, which is a reference to the Antichrist, who will enter Jerusalem. All these have been spoken. So toward the end of it, Christ will come and every eye will see as he descends to this earth. So Christ's appearance is unmistakable and there is no lack of clarity as to how he will come and rule this world. He will come in great Magnificent glory. But the days that precedes his return will be full of trouble. 
particularly for the Jews and for all those who trust in God everywhere because they would not bow down to Antichrist and his kingdom and he will try to exercise authority over everyone by saying you must bow down to the image that I set up and must have the mark of the number of the Antichrist. And if you don't have it, he will ban you from engaging in any commercial activity you can't buy or sell and that will lead to tremendous suffering on earth and there will be great great trouble all over the earth because of the natural calamities which God has predicted in his word Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 24 the book of Revelation talks about it they come in three series of judgments seal trumpet and vile judgments now listen to this in Romans chapter 6 uh, sorry Revelation chapter 6 uh, we read this pay attention to this verses 15 to 16 and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every born man and every free man hid themselves in dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand when the Lord comes like a lightning to confront the world and its army that shall gather in the valley of Armageddon the kings the mighty men the captains and every slave and soldier who gathered together to fight will be stricken with fear. And they will say to the mountains, collapse on us. We can't take it anymore. So brethren, the point is this. When Christ returned to rule this earth, it will not be a secret, quiet affair. He will come in his majesty, in his glory. His wrath of justice will shine through. However, we are told in verse 28, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Well, what exactly means have been debated? It is like a proverbial saying, isn't it? Where the corpse is, vultures will gather. You know, that's a proverbial saying in the Palestinian area. It's a common sight to see vultures swooping down when they see a dead corpse somewhere, whether it's animal or bird or human being. And when you see the vultures circling and looking down, you know there is death. So, this statement uh, could mean in this particular context that sin will increase, sin will be so ripe at that time, rebellion, blasphemy, abominable activities will be so ripe that God will not hesitate any longer. The time of mercy will end, justice will happen. And the Lord will come. To make his final stand against the corpse of sin and wickedness and rebellion. Like the dead animals in the wilderness that, that calls for the vultures to come. These dead lives of wicked men will invite the wrath of God upon themselves. And God will come. Christ will come. And he will punish evil with wrath. Now as we move further in verse 29 we are arrested by Jesus' insistence on sequence of events. Look at that. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, 
Interesting, isn't it? These are not said uh, in a light manner, without thinking. This is not an off-the-cuff statement. This is God, the eternal one, which was, which is, and which is to come. The Alpha and the Omega. The Lord who is sovereign, he speaks, and he speaks with meticular, meticulous attention to the details of events that would happen. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So, what is he talking about immediately after the tribulation of those days? He's saying that from verses 4 to 28, he has spoken about the tribulation period. It will be a seven-year period of great troubles. It, there will be spiritual deception. There will be unprecedented calamities. There will be political crisis, economic crisis. There will be the appearance of the Antichrist who will move into the temple that the Jews will build and he will make himself God. He will demand them to worship him. I've explained that when I expounded uh, Matthew 24, 15 before. And so midway through the tribulation, Antichrist will move into Jerusalem to control and to defy the greatness of God and to persecute the Jews when they refuse to bow to him. And all those things are called tribulation of those days. And so toward the end of those tribulation of those days, the Son of Man shall come. Immediately after. And that's what I was saying this, moment, this morning uh, to the GBI students when we studied the Revelation chapter 16, the sixth wild judgment. It also speaks very clearly Behold, he cometh like a thief in the night. The suddenness, the imminence, the surprise factor. The world will be taken all of a sudden. The world's army, the kings of the east, the ten kings, all will bring their army into the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of Armageddon. And they will all ready to consume Israel and destroy them. But they will never know what, they, what hit them because of the quickness with which the Lord shall come. Like a lightning from the east, he will come and by the sword of his mouth, he will destroy them. You can read that in Revelation 17 and Revelation 19. If you want to know more, please come every Sunday morning, GBI Studies. As I'm taking them through the last chapters of Revelation. Exciting times. Any time, by the way, the study of God's word is exciting. But so some people only the last day things. If you teach them Trinity, it's not exciting. If you teach them any other topic, not exciting. Only the last days. I tell you, if you don't study the rest of the Bible, you will never be prepared for the last days. If you get all the doctrines wrong, you will never be ready for the last days. So get the rest of the doctrine correct. Study all things. The whole counsel of the scriptures. Not just the last part of Revelation. But still, you can't deny it. You still have to study the last part of Revelation as well. So welcome. But remember, our Lord is God of eternity. There is no time outside him. Time is within him. God is eternal. That means he transcends time. The beginning and the end is within him. There is no be beginning without him. There is no with end without him. And he knows everything. Every epoch. Every dispensation of time in the history of man is known to him. And all things like the seasons of a year come as God has planned. And so he says, as though he knows what's the next season, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. How precise, how precise the Lord is. And now let's move to the second half of verse 29, where he says, the sun be darkened, 
the moon shall not give a light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. As the world was, is about to witness the soon return of Christ, it's almost like somebody turned off the light on the stage. There's this great anticipation, particularly in the heart of God's people who know the truth, who know uh, the scene very well and analyze all things according to the scriptures. Those believers who live in the last days, I mean, in the days of the tribulation, uh, will be very aware. Believer, believers will be watchful and they know what they are seeing. They are not going to succumb to the pressure. There will be demonic spirits going around to woo them to worship the Antichrist. False prophet will try to woo people to worship, but they would resist it. They are not going to say, oh, oh you are Christ, maybe Antichrist is Christ. Okay, we will come. We saw the miracles you do. The book of Revelation tells us the false prophet will do many miracles, great wonders to deceive people. Even the kings of the earth will be deceived by them. But God's people will resist. They would die for Christ. They will overcome the temptations even by giving their life in faithfulness to Christ. That's how they overcome. They don't overcome by living, but by dying for Christ. In death they are conquerors because nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Even in death, we will be so full of assurance and hope. We die in hope. For us to live and die are the same. In fact, I would say, dying is better. Living is for him. Dying is better because we will be with him forever. And so Christians, even during the tribulation time, will be watchful and they will know the stage is getting ready for the return and their heart will pump heart faster when they see suddenly the sun go dark. The moons give no light. There is no difference between day and night. Boom! The entire earth is in darkness. What would the believers say? Here he is he's coming. You know, sometimes when we go to watch a play, I don't go and watch plays nowadays, but when I was a primary school student, we used to have some, you know, school, school functions, so I still remember that. And all the children, hundreds of them sit in a big hall, and then all the lights are on, and then the teacher will come and say, we are going to have this program and this program. Everybody get ready, and we see uh, the stage being prepared and all that. We keep talking, and then suddenly the teacher says, Silence, please. In a minute, we shall start the program. The curtain is closed. The light goes off. It's quite dark and scary. And then we hear footsteps. We know they are getting ready soon. Light will come on on the stage and we can watch the drama. So those who know, the scriptures will say, well, sun has gone dark. There's no light. Soon we shall see the Son of Man coming like a lightning in heaven. This aspect of the sun and the moon and the stars without light is repeatedly stated in the scriptures. In fact, this morning I took time to explain that from the book of Revelation, from the book of Joel, and other places. Uh, so well, let's remember that. There is nothing in this universe that's outside the power of Christ. He can turn on and turn off the sun anytime he wants because he is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1.3 Nothing stays outside. There is no king on earth who can control sun, moon. He can get people to set up lights. He can get people to throw firecrackers and make excitements. He can get musicians to play drums and trumpets. 
But there will be no one on earth except our Lord Jesus Christ who can get the entire world to make the stage ready for his coming. Because he has created all things for his own glory. And so there you have our Lord who sustained the sun and the moon and stars in its place for the benefit of the people on earth, suddenly turning it off, saying, coming, here is the judge coming, the end is near. So remember, my friends, the entire world is in his hand. The earth and its Atmosphere and the outer space are all kept by the power of God. And they are all at his disposal. And when the Lord turns off whatever he chooses to, there will be chaos. There will be trouble. In fact, Revelation 16 tells us, as we learned this morning, the darkness is going to create pain in people. They will agonize. They know their teeth. They chew their teeth because of the fear and the trouble that would torment them. Would you take a look at what Isaiah said? Come with me to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, 1, 3. And verses 6 to 12. Isaiah 13, verses 6 to 12. How e, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. You see that? Jesus is saying the same thing that Isaiah said. Sun shall be darkened in his going forth. And the moon shall not cause a light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil. And the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than the fine gold. Even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens. And the earth shall remove out of her place. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts. And in the day of his fierce anger. Just want to stop the reading there. That is Isaiah's prediction of the last day chaos. That will come. As the world get ready for the arrival of the judge. Our great savior. Who will meet with the forces of the world. That will gather in the valley of Armageddon. Led by the Antichrist. Well, there are plenty more of such explanations in the book of Daniel, whether uh, Daniel of Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel. Everywhere we see such statements. They are worth reading and studying. Now, that's why I keep on saying, come, come and learn God's word. It's amazing and wonderful. Don't miss on these things. And so when the luminaries of the sky become dark. What will happen? Come back to chapter 24 of Matthew, verse 30. Jesus says this, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man 
in heaven. The sign of the Son of Man in heaven. What is a sign in the sky? What is that supernatural sign suddenly appearing? It's called the sign of the Son of Man. Now that does not mean there will be something peculiar that will point to Christ. You know, some ancient commentators said, uh, like uh, Chrysostom or Cyril of Jerusalem, uh, and I think some others like Oregon, they said, well, this could be the sign of the cross. Suddenly, at the end of time in the sky, there will be a huge cross appearing. But that's pure speculation. There is no such thing in the scriptures. <clears throat> but they are devout men. I don't want to say they were uh, ungodly or anything. That was their guess at that time. Well, there are other people who say different things about it. But I don't think here the statement sign of the Son of Man means there'll be something peculiar to point to that. But the sign here is the Lord himself. The sign of should not be taken as objective genitive, but as subjective genitive. That means the subject is of the sign is Christ himself. The Son of Man himself will be the sign. He will appear. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear. And it clearly says that his appearance will not be in terms of just some indications or symbols. He will appear in the sky. And he will appear like the lightning, he said. Remember the first verse we read, verse 27. Like a lightning he will appear. In glory he will appear. And he is called the Son of Man. The sign of the Son of Man. Jesus, the Son of God, took him upon himself the appearance of a man. He was both God and man in his first coming. 100% God and 100% man, the Theanthropos, the God-man. When he ascended to heaven, he didn't leave his body here and change into a spirit form. He went up as a man, and he shall come down as a man, as a son of man, the perfect man, the glorious man. He will come looking like unto us, but in his glory. He is our elder brother. For he has come to adopt us into his family. I had this beautiful and blessed opportunity to expound the doctrine of the children of the Most High to our youths for a week that passed us. And some of the testimonies are appearing today. There are two testimonies and a report. I hope you will read. It was my joy to learn it Rethink, obey, and preach it. I preached the doctrine of adoption some time ago in the Bible Witness Retreat. And it was another opportunity to take some of them and further add to it to exhort our youths. You know how wonderful it is that Son of God came to this world to call us to be sons of God. And thus he became our elder brother to bring us home to the Father. And he's coming to take us home. And when he comes, he will judge the wicked men of this world who persecuted his children, his brothers on earth. God will send the Son in glory. And at that time, we are told in verse 30, Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the, in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When Jesus comes again in his majestic glory, the world that hated him, the world of Antichrist, the world that persecuted and killed God's servants in millions within the seven-year period of tribulation, will be shocked 
they will stand in awe and fear. Jesus says, this Jesus who spoke this word says about himself that he shall come in power and in great glory. At that time, all the tribes of the earth shall weep and cry. They will mourn for him. But isn't it too late? Like I read a while ago at the beginning from Revelation 6. The mighty men, the kings, the captains, the generals, the, the great, great, powerful, wealthy people of this world will gather there. They'll be, they'll be holding their wine cups and say, you're going to have a great victory. All are here. Right. Good. Oh, China, India, Japan, Singapore. All right. All are here. Good. All oh, the kings, we are here. Cheers. Boom. <laughs> they see a sign. The Son of Man coming. And they scream. Helpless beings. All the glory melt away at the heat of his return. All the arrogancy shall be humiliated and humbled into the dust of the earth. And they mourn as they perish. They sigh without deliverance. They might be saying as they die, Oh, we want to repent. Too late. Brethren, isn't it clear? Jesus said in Acts 1, 11, as I read a while ago, just as the Son of Man went up in the clouds, he shall come again. Doubt not. Doubt not. He will come again in the clouds. That's exactly what the Bible says in verse 30. Jesus is saying, look at that again. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Can it be the natural clouds that we see? I mean the water vapor, dark clouds that we see? Or could it be the supernatural cloud that often appeared to show God's presence in the tabernacle and the temple of the Old Testament, which we refer to as Shekinah glory? I want to think it's not just natural cloud. Even if there might have been, there might be some cloud, this is the cloud of glory and majesty. The scripture clearly tells us that God used clouds as his chariots. For example, Psalm 104 verse 3 says, he led the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariots, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. He rides high. He comes in glorious cloud. Listen to this. This is taken from Zechariah, chapter 14. Verses 6 and 7. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. And it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day or night. But it shall come to pass that at the evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. Now what I read tells us of the glory of Christ's return which will remove all darkness. It shall come to pass that evening time it shall be light. And when Jesus comes to this world, in such powerful glory and majesty, Jerusalem will be bright even in the evening. His glory shall fill that city. 
amazing things are going to happen right there. How amazing. There will be no darkness. Christ will be the light of that great city. Darkness that pervaded the earth in the final stage of great tribulation shall com will completely move away. And there is no need of sun, actually. Christ himself shall be the light. Brethren, this in itself should make us wonder. Is the world giving any consideration to any of these things? No. What are the main topics of our time? What are the main topics of our time? Economic crisis, worries about incurable diseases, what else? Terrorism, wars. Recently I see a lot of soldiers walking around. Special forces of police, even in in uh, MRT stations. Just two days ago, I was at Mac McPherson MRT. I was walking toward our new place, 33 Ubi Crescent. And I took the train the other day, and I, most of the time I'm driving. So uh, the other day I had to send a van for servicing, so I had to take the public transport. So uh, I, I never see, saw police in such uh, full gear, ready to shoot kind of appearance. And I see them in big numbers, in not, many, many groups. One group go, going down the escalator on this side of McPherson, and on the other side, another group coming up. And when I went down, there were so many walking around. I thought, hey, what happened? Uh, if I look at them, they will look at me. So I just look here and there, look at them, look here and there, look at them. And I walked. And, and then uh, I see them in many places in the last few weeks. Why? There's some fear somewhere. And I read a long article the other day about the Singapore government's preparation for the year-end gathering in Esplanade. I don't think they are trying to scare us, but they are trying to protect us. Why are these troubles in this world? Is it not because the Lord already said these are coming on the way? But who bothers? People tend to look at the problem and forget the cause of the problem. Why are these coming? Why this distress? Why this upheaval? Why this, you know, spinning out of the entire world? What's happening? Very easy. Very easy for those who know. They will close their eyes and say with a smile, My Lord shall come. My Lord shall soon come. How about you? How about you? Are you caught in the thicket of all this desperation by people who live only for this world? Just this world? Worrying about husband and worrying about wife and worrying about children and what would parents say or what would friends say? You are so stuck in it and you don't bother about serving the Lord with readiness for He is coming for us. Only that which is done for Christ shall last. All else shall burn away including the great things that we set up and rejoice. 33 will be crescent will go away. Yesterday evening, I had a little bit of time. I wanted to relax, so I opened my Photoshop and started to draw. I draw some flowers and a small plant budding. And then after that, I rode by the side and asked my wife, is it okay? Like the flowers that fade, our lives also shall soon pass away. I, I, I tried to draw a nice picture, but I didn't want to keep it there and make people think this means we shall be so. This beauty of the earth shall go soon. 
But the beauty of the Son of Man shall outclass and outshine and outlast everything that we are chasing after. So, brethren, look at the strength and the glory of our Lord. He will come back in majesty, doubt not. He will come in great strength and great glory that shall never fade. All else shall vanish, but Christ and his kingdom endureth forever. The unbelievers on earth are dying because of the war and fear and disease and all kinds of natural calamities such as the shooting stars, meteors like mountain burning with fire, falling into the sea and the entire sea becoming bitter and full of blood. All the animals, all the creatures in the sea all dying. And there will not be a single fresh water body on the face of the earth that is good to drink. It is going to be chaos. It will be a stinking earth because of death and carnage. Nothing but fear. Yet man will not surrender himself to God. The Bible clearly says in Revelation chapter 16, people did not repent, neither give glory to God. But he doesn't bother. He has all glory to himself. He shall come in the face of utter defiance to show how mighty he is and how glorious he is. In strength and in glory, he shall return. What is preoccupying your mind, my brother? Young man, what excites you? I know we cannot stop chasing this world, isn't it? But stop for a minute. Is it worth it? I think the Lord is talking to some of you. Time is coming to an end. Rise up, give your life and serve him. And get ready to see your great Lord. There is no point wasting a lot of time serving the kings of this earth. Saying I am hired by world famous MNC. When they say M and C, you know, multinational company. You know, there's a show called um, what? Wheel of Fortune. Uh, when I was younger, I used to watch, I look forward to the evening to watch this half an hour thing. You know, I like to fill, the, fill, the bl fill in the blanks, not because of money. I, I get nothing anyway. So, but I like to fill in the blanks. So I used to look forward to it. But you know, in, before that, I forgot the lady's name. The guy's name is Pat, I think, the guy who runs the game. And he asked people, introduce yourself. Uh, your name and where you work. And always I heard this thing. I work for a large MNC. I work for a large multi, multi... I don't know why people like to say it. I used to scratch my head. Almost every week I heard this thing and I said, oh, this is ridiculous, turn it off. I mean, even a, a sweeper in a big, big uh, uh, company would say, I work for a multinational company. What's the big deal? It's like an interesting story from my home country. Uh, you know, we had a family with a son who is very mischievous and naughty, never studies. Uh, and finally, somebody said, OK, come with me. I take you to the Persian Gulf, and I give you a job. So the fellow went. Finally, we are glad, and the parents were most glad that he went. He went to one of the Gulf countries. And then the next Sunday, the father came to the prayer meeting, and he said, I thank God my son got a good job, and there are 600 people under him. And we all said, ah, how can he get such a big job? What he meant is he is a cleaner on the 10th floor. Yeah, 600 people work under him. This is the pride of this world. Oh, we are working for somebody big. Who bothers? There is no one who is bigger than our Lord Jesus. I hope you will have the 
courage of heart and the joy of heart to say, I am a servant of the Most High. I purposely put the children's theme, the youth's theme, as children of the Most High. I could have written the children of God, but I put it deliberately, children of the Most High. That's a great grand doctrine. To be regenerated, to be adopted as heirs of God and join us with Christ. And to be partakers of his soon coming glory is a joy unspeakable, full of glory. Now don't live to live. Live to serve Christ and die in the service of God. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Who can say that? Some people say, oh, if I serve the Lord in the church, especially get so many, you get peanuts. Try, right, you get peanuts. At least you get peanuts. It's true. Our church is not able to pay high salary. And so, how? 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 Why, how? Why, why? If the Lord called you, you must know. If you seek his kingdom, he will take care of you. If he calls you, he will fulfill it. It is with strength and glory the Lord reigns. Do not be shattered in your hearts because of problems and unresolved issues of this life. Let them be. Let them all be around. Let's serve the Lord for he is our soon coming king. He will reward us. He will not reward us because we live with muscles and powers and a lot of money. He will reward us for serving him and giving our life in service to God. Yes, strength and glory awaits. Nothing less than that. And brethren, nobody will be lost. He will call all his people to himself. Look at verse 31. I will pick it up again next week. But here ends. And he will send forth his angels. Right? So clearly verse 31 says. Why will he send his angels? With a great sound of a trumpet. To gather together his elect. From the four winds. From one end of heaven. To the other. <laughs> no matter where you are. The Lord knows how to gather you. Angels are gatherers. They are not only ministering servants to us. They also have a duty at the end of time to gather all of God's people to himself. In that day, the Lord will use the angels to gather the unbelievers for judgment. Jesus said that in Matthew's gospel chapter 13. But he will also gather them to reward them with his glory. The great trumpet shall sound and the servants of God, the angels, shall move forth across the face of the earth. Whether we are in Singapore or New York or Jerusalem or wherever we be, God will gather us all. By the angels. Can you imagine you being accompanied by the angels and you will be ushered into the glorious presence of God by Christ Himself? It's amazing. I'm sure you are all familiar with the beginning of a wedding ceremony. The bride is all dressed in glory beautiful, dressed, and there goes the bridesmaids, the page boys, the ring bearer. And we know when they come, the bride is just around the corner. Soon we'll see a glimpse of the bride. So when the angels hear the trumpet being played, they get immediately forward with the saints of God 
ushering them into the presence of Christ. The Son of Man is coming. He shall soon come. Have you trusted him? Are you saved? Are you waiting for him? Is your decisions in life are with reference to his return? Or are you doing all things with reference to this perishing world? May it be all for Christ. Only that shall have eternal rewards. Let us all arise and sing our final hymn.